I am Dale with Realvolve Firepoint, and joining me today are uh, Justin and Rob, both killer Remax team leaders. And today we're going behind the scenes. So we're going to be asking uh, Rob and Justin about their secrets um, as, as top team leaders um, in the Remax network. What are their secrets to success? Um, so Rob is the team leader of the, of the Golfie team. Uh, Remax Escarpment, and that's outside of Toronto. Is that correct, Rob? Yeah, Hamilton, Niagara is where we, uh, yeah, just along the uh, Queen Elizabeth corridor around the Golden Horseshoe. Just, we're about 45 minutes outside of Toronto. Got it. And Justin Haver, I, I probably butchered both of your last names. Um, of, of Justin, is that Haver? Justin Haver, yeah. Yeah, okay. Justin Haver and Associates, uh, Remax First, and you're uh, more in, in central Canada, is that correct? I'm in Alberta, so I'm located in uh, Calgary, and uh, yeah, 45 minutes away from the Rocky Mountains, our little playground. Lovely. So um, I want to start off today's um, broadcast with, with a poll, um, and I also want to mention a couple of things here. So we, we're recording the webinar, uh, and we will send out the recording. So if you miss any part of this, you're going to get a follow-up email with the recording. Um, please, please put your questions in the chat and the Q&A. We'd love to get some interaction from everybody um, to help us understand what to focus on. And um, without further ado, first poll, what is your role on the team? So for those attending the webinar, what is your role? Uh, what best describes you? So you should see that poll pop up, um, I think. Let me see if I, I might have to do that now. There we go. So we'll give everybody a couple of minutes here to, or not a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds to answer that. What is your role on the team? What best describes you? All right, so while we're waiting those, for those uh, responses to come in, I'm gonna close that up in, uh, in just a second here. I wanted to start off by um, asking uh, Justin and Rob, can you guys briefly, maybe uh, Justin, we'll, we'll go to you first. Can you briefly describe your team um, as it current, currently stands? Maybe a, a 15 second rundown of uh, kind of the state of the union for you. Awesome, yeah, we're a team of uh, licensed agents out of Remax First here in uh, Calgary, Alberta. Remax First was actually the very first Remax brokerage uh, in uh, all of Canada. And our team consists of uh, just over 50 licensed agents, plus about 10 support staff. And then I have uh, four people in a leadership role, whether it comes from an operations manager, uh, have a dedicated systems and trainer as well. And uh, yeah, no, we just have a lot of fun selling real estate uh, day after day. Love it. Rob? Yeah, so we're a, a team of about 37 uh, agents and uh, we have probably about uh, seven or eight uh, uh, support staff. That's including uh, ma management. Um, and uh, my job basically is to support the agents. Sometimes we do get uh, people that request for me to be there and uh, I will go there with the agent uh, so that just for the support to, uh, you know, so that we get that listing. It doesn't happen often, but, but I, I'm there to, you know, if they're working on something difficult as a, an, an evaluation, I'll, I'll be there for them on that and anything else they need to go on. Got it. Um, perfect. So for both of you, what, what are the kind of support roles? How do you look at your support roles? Um, on the team. So Justin, you have about 10, you said, and Rob, you have seven or eight. So Justin, um, what, go ahead, Rob. Well, okay, yeah, no, I've got a, 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 a director of um, operations and basically handles all onboarding IT integrations and, uh, you know, fine tunes company uh, processes. Got a director of sales that she's been with me now just, just for a year and handles all recruitment efforts, runs our team meetings and holds agents, uh, uh, um, accountable and on a daily basis. And, uh, and we just uh, started with a director of uh, marketing, uh, handles all digital media efforts uh, with us. And, and then we have our, our admin staff that handles, you know, all the uh, admin things like broker loading uh, listings and, and handling all the 
closings and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and then, the, and then a few that basically answer phone calls and, you know, the front receptionist and all that, um, that, uh, outside staff that handles different things in, in the office. Great. Justin. So, yeah, so our team is built up of, uh, like I said, I got director of operations who is someone that has been, uh, you know, in the industry for well over 20 years and who's also a licensed broker. And I have an additional uh, support leader as well, Dave, that uh, just recently joined up with us, who has uh, 15 years experience managing and also have been a broker in another broker, uh, several broker just here in the city. So their roles is basically a lot of uh, support for the agents when it comes to the transaction side, uh, a lot of uh, interview, hiring, firing sometimes as well. And then I uh, got a, a marketing team, which uh, consists of uh, two people doing our social media our, and uh, ad creative. And then we have uh, in-house videographer, in-house uh, photographers. We have a client care coordinator. And then we have, um, you know, Neil, who is our systems and trainer. Uh, so he basically ensures that our system, our CRM for that matter is uh, operating uh, at the best capacity that we can and always, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, we have all the training materials and support for the agents, uh, you know, for them to kind of learn our systems and processes uh, to ensure that uh, they are set up for success. And then we have, uh, you know, several admin staff that, uh, you know, work from client care coordinator to, um, you know, again, uh, receptionists and uh, follow up and also supporting their, the agents if they have any questions or needs as well. And um, how do you know, Justin, when you have the right balance of, of agents to support staff? <clears throat> what are the things you're looking for? Well, I mean, it's uh, what we just basically look at is uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, there's no holes in the in the business and uh, you know we look at uh, you know if the agents are overwhelmed or if they can need more support so it's, it's a fine balance although a lot of our agents do ha handle a lot of the stuff on their own when it comes to you know uh, transactions paperwork that kind of stuff because we have it uh, very systemized so you know it's very easy for them to you know simply just follow the system that we have laid out for them and Rob, what happens when leads come in? Who handles um, kind of the lead flow in your business um, and where the agents come in and, and start picking them up? Well, the, when the leads come in, they're, uh, they go to a lead coordinator and we find out if they've been uh, in our, if they're in our system and if anybody has been in touch with that particular person that uh, already and then we'll send that lead to the person that's already been in touch with that person in the past if not we will send it to uh, whoever whatever area that they're possibly looking for or whatever area uh, they're looking at buying and, and try to set up the right the right lead to the right person great so um, we found out just now during that poll that about 32 percent of the attendees today are team leaders 39% are solo agents. And then we've got some team members, um, some assistants and other admin staff and, and then broker owners. Um, and 47% um, want to grow, 42% are in growth mode, 15% are in maintaining mode. Um, so I know both of you had comments about growth uh, when we talked the other day. Justin, what do you think about growth in your business? I mean, we're at the end of the year here. Um, I know you've got, you guys have both done some, some pretty rigorous planning in your own businesses and, and are planning for growth next year. How do you approach growth, Justin? Well, I think uh, me personally, I always have the mindset of uh, growing the business, uh, always uh, looking to obviously enhance and create more and more opportunities for the active members on the team. And uh, at the same time, constantly growing and recruiting agents uh, to come onto the team as well. Uh, you know, primarily my focus is to ensure that everybody on the team has ample opportunities so they can provide for themselves and their families. And uh, we kind of look at it as, you know, based on the lead flow that's kind of coming in as well. If we have an abundance of opportunities, uh, perhaps we're you know, this has actually been a struggle that we've had all year, even with 50 agencies. We struggle with having 
uh, leads being picked up by agents because everybody's uh, you know so busy. So that's a clear indicator to us that we need to continue to bring on more great agents and uh, you know don't be afraid of growing the business at all. And uh, I'm of the opinion that if you are going to have it have a team and run a team you need to ensure that you have the opportunities to support them um you know i've seen a lot of people try to build teams without having the opportunities and uh i don't think that's necessarily the right way in my opinion so justin how how much time do you spend analyzing the numbers like that how much time do you spend looking at the reports and finding holes like that you know, our business has grown uh, quite a bit over the years, and now we have a lot of people in place. So, I mean, we review numbers on a daily basis uh, with the systems guy and with the, some of the admin. And, uh, you know, we track number of calls that are inbound, number of new leads every day, number of inquiries. And, uh, you know, we really kind of look at the trends as well. I also, you know, dive into Google Analytics to kind of see uh, what kind of uh, traffic our websites is getting. And I check that on a daily basis. I might be a little bit of an obsession, but it's another story. Um, you know, so just always just uh, having a pulse on the business uh, to ensure that things are running well. And at the same time that, uh, you know, we don't have any holes in the business or we need to add additional staff or agents. So Rob, um, I know both of you, uh, you and Justin, both had a lot to say about lessons that you learned in the past. Um, one of the things that came up that was a pretty big deal for both of you was accountability. Um, you mind sharing with us how you approach, uh, approach accountability? And, and to set the stage a little bit um, for everybody listening, this is one of the things that most teams that we talk to struggle with, that it's always a big focus for them. Um, accountability with the agents, getting the agents to do what you ask them to do. Um, Justin just mentioned one of the things they struggle with is getting the agents to respond to the leads in a timely manner, whether that's overwhelm, overload, or whether that's an accountability issue in your team, it seems to be across the board kind of a, a ubiquitous problem or, or challenge uh, that never ends. So Rob, how do you approach accountability with your team? Well, we're, we're watching uh, the CRM to find out they're putting notes in there so that we can see what they're doing. Um, also, we want them to, you know, when they do get a lead, they follow up with it right away, not uh, 24 hours later. They're, they're doing it within the hour, but we prefer it within five to 10 minutes. Um, uh, our ratio of, of, of getting that as a client is a lot greater the sooner we get that, that lead. Um, also, um, we will penalize them if they're not uh, actively doing anything online uh, with that lead and putting notes in into our CRM. Um, and we're actually adding another person uh, to, uh, uh, to, to make sure that not, nothing is left behind um, with uh, the accountability, especially on, a, on, a, on our leads because uh, we know we're spilling business and uh, now we want to capture, we don't want anything spilled. We want everything, everything taken care of and followed up on. And uh, so that, uh, that every lead is taken, taken care of uh, every time. Hmm. And Justin, uh, you mentioned, and Rob mentioned this too, accountability is at its all time highest this year. Um, and maybe even it's, it's going to continue to go up. Talk to us about how you and your team approach accountability. Well, accountability, I mean, is uh, I think something that we all try to avoid at some point in time in our lives, right? And, uh, you know, one of the things that we have learned over the years is that accountability is something that will actually make people, including myself, more productive. Um, the thing is, you can't make a human being productive. You can only facilitate uh, the best condition for someone to choose to be productive so what we have uh, learned over the years is that you know we set uh, the expectations of the agents when we hire them so you know we basically lay out what the expectations are for lead follow-up for learning our systems for learning our presentations and um, we ensure that that is crystal clear when we're sitting at the hiring table and obviously the agent will also 
uh, verbalize to us that they are willing to commit to those uh, expectations and uh, that they're okay with us holding them accountable. We obviously run uh, our CRM system and uh, we watch that, uh, you know, and again, it comes from ensuring that, you know, we convert the leads at the highest possible level, uh, ensuring that we have the right number of contact attempts and, if, you know, an agent is perhaps, um, you know, really low on their average contact attempts, speed of response, all that stuff. We look at that as a training opportunity to see if there's anything that we can do better. Uh, perhaps uh, we didn't train them how to use the system properly. And, uh, you know, they might also be in a position of overwhelm where they have too many opportunities in their system. So this year, we've actually been kind of preaching less is more. You know, a lot of agents have the mindset that, you know, they need more and more leads. And uh, we're more of the opinion that, you know, just have enough leads, but do more follow up. You know, 80% of the sales happen in contact attempt five to 12. So if we can ensure that we are hitting, you know, minimum five, uh, we've even had some agencies here that are averaging close to 20 contact attempts per lead. And guess what? They're converting at a pretty high level. So, uh, you know, using the system, I mean, as a tool to track, because I mean, at the same time, um, you know, it holds the agents accountable to ensure that they are doing the proper follow up on the leads that, you know, you, the team leader are providing to them. And we all know that some of these leads uh, can have a very high cost to the organization. Uh, some of the leads that we acquire on our team has, uh, you know, a cost of close to a thousand bucks per appointment. So we obviously want to ensure that you know, the agents follow the system and not only just to convert to lead, but also to ensure that, you know, every client has the same or virtually the same client experience, whichever agent they work with. Yeah, that consistency is key. Um, so Tamara has a follow-up question, Justin. Um, and Rob, same, same question goes to you uh, after Justin answers. Um, are you providing the leads or how much do you expect your agents to bring in? You know, we provide the leads uh, and we provide a lot of them. Um, you know, so we don't necessarily have expectations of agents to go and get their own leads. If they have their own uh, sphere of influence or are able to generate their own leads, that is awesome. That's good for them. And they get compensated for that where they have different splits. But uh, overall, I mean, uh, our machine is, uh, you know, running pretty good where we have an overflow of opportunity. So, you know, if they don't want to work their own sphere of influence, they don't have to because there's just an abundance of opportunities. Hmm. Rob? Yeah, we, uh, we do provide uh, an abundance of leads. And uh, if they, like, we don't, like Justin says, we don't uh, bank on any of theirs, but when they do come in, you know, that, that's nice. Um, we don't actually, our splits don't change on anything. Everything's all the same right across the board. So there's no arguments. There's no, well, you know, this was my cousin. This was, you know, my distant cousin that I haven't talked to. It's, it's the same whether we give them the lead or they bring in their own uh, sphere of influence or, or family or friends or whatever. So it's, uh, the splits are all the same. And uh, we just found that uh, we had, we've never had any, uh, any issues whatsoever uh, when we kept everything the same. And how many buyer agents do you have versus listing agents, Rob? And, and how, do you, um, how do you manage that? Well, when, when they start off with us, um, just, um, they start off as basically uh, as a, as a buyer agent, but it doesn't restrict them from listing homes, but we do have a, uh, um, and you graduate to be a, a listing agent once you've, you know, the, you know, the, the presentation well, and, and we feel confident in, in you going to any listing whatsoever. Um, I I'd say probably, uh, 40, 40% 40 of our team, uh, would be uh, listing agents that we would just automatically get uh, if we get a call regarding a house or a listing uh, that they're looking at putting their house on the market. We have probably a select that would get that first. And uh, but the buyer agents do list also, 
um, you know, from leads that they get, or even, uh, you know, from, you know, maybe doing an open house, they pick up somebody, but we do have a select core that do, uh, listings and, and that's it. And it's probably about, I'd, I'd say, uh, 35% uh, of our team that is, is a dedicated listing team. Justin, do you approach that differently? Yeah, a bit differently. I mean, uh, we have eight agents that are dedicated listing specialists and that's all they do all day long. Um, they're, they're the ones who get the listing, listing leads that we generate from radio, TV, billboards, and other forms of advertising. And, um, you know, they still have the ability to obviously work with buyers if they choose to as well and, or if a seller needs to buy. Uh, but uh, some of them are also even just handing off the, the buyer side of the transaction to, uh, you know, the agents that are considered buyer agents. Our buyer agents are also uh, able to list properties as long as they have shown us that they know the presentation and uh, they have a good uh, idea of how to do a CMA and all that kind of stuff. So again, we're really focused on ensuring that the client experience is the same no matter who the agent they're working with. So, and I know both of you, um, when agents are maybe not performing to the level that you're expecting them to, to perform at, um, you, you're going to take some action. That's where the accountability comes in. Um, Rob, you mentioned penalize agents when they're not following up with the leads properly. And we have probably three or four questions uh, about that. So I'll start with you, Rob. How do you handle um, that, that punishment, so to speak? We, we will we'll stop sending them leads until they, um, for probably two weeks to uh, a month. And then so that they can get on the, on their CRM and, and, and then, handle that uh to, to, so that we believe that they learn their lesson and um yeah no it's uh we take it seriously uh here and uh we're not gonna i like like justin does i i spent thousands and thousands of dollars uh trying to make that phone ring or, or or get leads generated and i can't afford to have somebody not care uh about you know a lead sitting there for over 24 hours and nobody touching it so yeah, those are precious, right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, Justin? Yeah, so I mean, we look at it as, you know, when we bring on an agent, uh, we give them, uh, you know, 50 leads from the lead pond, which is, uh, you know, older leads. Some of them may be returning to the websites, that kind of stuff. And we basically give them those 50 leads so they can get used to following and using the system so they get comfortable. Once they get comfortable, comfortable they will get onto leads. And then we do monitor, you know, how they perform and, you know, if their average contact attempts are low, if they're not following the process, we will pause, not penalize, but we will pause uh, any new leads and, uh, you know, spend some one-on-one -on -one time with them to really give them the opportunity to get a grasp of how the CRM works and what the expectations are again, because perhaps we weren't clear enough in our uh, training opportunity with them when we uh, were first getting them into the system. So I kind of look at it as, you know, um, you know, from a standpoint of if the agent isn't succeeding, uh, it could also be something that we are doing wrong in the support role for the agents. Uh, but, you know, once we kind of go through everything and ensure that they're set up, it's just up to them to show us that they got what it takes. Yeah, I love that. You assume that it's a, a problem with the systems or how things are done on the team. And um, if you find out that, that, that it's not, then you're addressing it um, as a teaching opportunity with the agents. Yeah, it, it could also be a teaching opportunity for us too, right? Because uh, maybe, uh, you know, we didn't teach it properly. Maybe there's a better way for us to teach. Hmm. Right? So, so we, can't, we can't always blame the agents, right? So we got to take responsibility. Uh, as team leaders for pretty much everything that goes on in our organization. And, you know, if leads aren't being followed up with, I mean, guess what? Uh, the onus falls on me essentially because, uh, you know, I let it happen. So um, I got to take responsibility for that. And then I got to look at, okay, so why was it that the agent uh, wasn't able to follow up properly or miss this opportunity? Um, you know, we got to kind of look at how we operate within the system and how that slipped through and then, uh, you know, plug the holes. So Justin, we, we know that um, accountability can't be present without expectations being set uh, ahead of time. Um, so 
why don't you share with everybody what you're doing to set expectations with, uh, with your agents? Yeah. So, I mean, we have, we even have, um, like, I mean, if you're running a team, I believe that you should have a team member agreement. And one of the things that we have in our team member agreement is step-by-step -step expectations for what we expect for them when they're working with the buyer, when they're working with the seller. And then, uh, you know, we revisit all of those expectations in our onboarding and in our training. And, uh, you know, what, and uh, we also have the agents, you know, we, when we interview with them, we, uh, you know, make these expectations clear. And we also ask them to send us a video. You know, what will it mean for you to be a member of the Justin Haver Associates of REMAX first team? And two, what level of commitment can we expect from you? And we get them to send us a video on that. And, uh, you know, it's uh, quite fascinating. And, you know, it's uh, also a powerful tool down the road if you want to revisit, you know, a, perhaps a scenario where an agent isn't meeting the expectations that they declare to us. Simply replay the video. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I always tell my team that the three most powerful words in sales are earlier you said. And that works on a sales call or when you're talking with, with your team, um, helping them to perform at a high level. Um, so I love that. You, you, you can say, earlier you said, this is what was going to happen. Now it's kind of off track. What's going wrong here? So Rob, I know you, you approach it um, similarly, but slightly different. Talk to us about what do you do in your team to set expectations and maintain those expectations and high level of ability? Um, basically, just uh, um, dress code is important for us, uh, uh, expectations. Um, staying in touch with our uh, sales coordinator, um, on a weekly basis, uh, making sure that, um, you know, they're meeting their expectations, um, following up on their, uh, CRM every, um, every day. Um, uh, like our expectations are pretty, pretty high when they come on board. We, we warn them saying, listen, this is not just where you can sit back and think that, uh, this is uh, selling sunset and just walking around looking good. This is, you know, you got to work hard in this business and follow up and, and, and do, and, and, and work. And like, we've got, uh, we feel like we have a strong brand in our, in our market and having that brand, uh, behind you should make it a lot easier than any other, uh, real estate team or, or agent in our market, uh, to get in the door and, and, and to, to get that buyer deal or, or listing deal. So, um, and, uh, we will sit down with them if we feel that, uh, things aren't uh, going, uh, what we, we feel that they, they promised us when they started and, um, and we have no problem, uh, letting, uh, letting people go. Um, we've got uh, a reputation, uh, a good reputation in our market and we want to keep it that way. Yeah. So, I mean, what I'm hearing from both of you is, um, Accountability is not something that slips and expectations are not loose. They're very clear and you have very regular cadences for reviewing those expectations and holding the agents accountable. It's something that, that is always kind of driving uh, things forward. Yeah, and I think it's incredibly important to operate in principle and, you know, basically be crystal clear. Um, I always say, you know, my... Um, well, everything lies in our team member agreement because that's where we have everything kind of laid out. So we're crystal clear on what we bring to the table. We're crystal clear on what expectations we have of uh, the agents, right? So that's where pretty much my integrity lies in that agreement. So if there's ever any, you know, gray areas or any questions, we go back to the agreement. It's kind of like when you're selling a property or buying a property, what does the contract say? Right. Uh, you know, because I mean, I've learned a lot over the years. I've failed a lot. And, uh, you know, I've also grown as a leader myself as well. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting journey for sure. But accountability is definitely something that has taken our business to the next level. Uh, it was perhaps something that I may have been afraid of before uh, in my earlier days. But, uh, you know, it definitely is something that moves the needle when it comes to productivity. And we kind of kind of look around, you know, society as well. I mean, you look at um, high performance athletes, you know, professional sports, 
they're all held to a standard and they have accountability. We, we had uh, uh, a girl that left us about two and a half years ago and uh, she admitted to me probably about, uh, I think about six months ago, admitted uh, she left and she'd been on uh, two or three different teams and different brokerages and everything. And she realized her sales were better with us. She said, you know what? Nobody has, nobody of uh, these other teams were made like accountable. Uh, like they just let her be a free bird on their team. And, uh, and we were always on her making sure she was doing her job right and everything. And her sales were high. She's never hit the volume of sales uh, uh, with anybody else besides us. We normally don't hire back when somebody leaves. Uh, it's a one way door. Um, and a lot of times when, uh, they leave for a while and they come back, they, they may feel that they have, the, it's the same atmosphere. The culture does change a little bit and they come back and they feel it's going to be the same way. And it, and it isn't, we do have a good culture, but, um, uh, but because of the accountability that, uh, that we expect, uh, our agents, do well and when they leave and they think it's great the grass is greener on the other side they realize how important and how good it was with us and uh, sometimes uh, they want to come back and we just we just say sorry you know mm -hmm. otherwise we're just gonna leave let an example of other people leaving and they know they can come back so we just just it's a one-way door for us yeah I mean so I want to I want to touch on one more thing on accountability. I could talk about accountability for for another thirty minutes, but I do want to move on to some other things. Um, but you know, Harvest Harvard Business Review and other um, you know business publications do a lot of study around communication and, and accountability. And one of the things that um, they find is people that are held more accountable are happier in their job and they perform better. So their satisfaction in their job their satisfaction with their own performance and their satisfaction directly with their manager increases with the level of accountability. Um, but I think it is important to note that both of you have talked about setting those expectations properly. You can't set a high level of accountability on the team if there's loose guidelines, loose expectations. That's a recipe for, for disaster. Um, so the last thing I wanted to touch on on accountability was both of you said um, that two of the best decisions you've ever made in the business were about the coach that you have for yourself and for the team and uh, around hiring a sales manager to help you in, in the team. Um, Justin, can you talk a little bit about that? And then Rob, I'll go to you. Yeah. And I mean, you know what, uh, I think having a coach is, uh, something that can be very, very impactful for yourself personally and professionally. Uh, myself, I was introduced to John Sheplak, uh, here about four years ago and I was, you know, going through some personal challenges and I was introduced uh, to John Sheplak and, uh, it has been, um, incredible for myself personally. And, uh, you know, because, However you operate, I mean, you're, we're all human beings. And if we got shit, I'm going to call it, going on in our personal lives, it is very likely that it's also going to show up in our business. So I've discovered that, you know what, uh, making that investment into yourself, uh, fixing yourself, it allows you to be a better leader. And that also shows up in the work and within the organization. And uh, we have our entire leadership team coach with John Sheplak as well. And uh, we also coach the entire team with Chef Black once a week. And, uh, you know, it's really all about facilitating an environment for where people can feel safe, comfortable, uh, and have the ability to grow with the support of, uh, you know, the entire organization. Uh, you know, the only way to get a human being to make a choice, make a change, or move into higher production is through self-discovery and uh, you know it's very uncomfortable for a lot of a lot of us to go through personal development and work on ourselves and looking in the mirror taking personal responsibility for you know your personal crap or taking responsibility for what goes on in your organization uh, when you do that and and if you're a leader and you have the ability to be open and vulnerable with your organization uh, you'd be amazed of uh, what can actually happen within that um so you know that's uh, been a, a great journey for myself and uh you know i know that uh, rob also coaches with uh, john sheplak now as well 
Yeah. And Rob, Rob, sorry, before we get to you, Justin, what about the sales manager? Um, how has a sales manager helped you and, and how have other people on the team helped you with that accountability? Yeah, you know what? Um, I stepped out of production probably about five years ago. And I also discovered that I needed to have help run and manage the team. And uh, bringing on Tom it was a, a, a life-changing event for myself. Um, you know, it basically has also helped me create a little bit of barrier around me as well, where I can, you know, get my head above water and breathe. And, uh, you know, he's uh, an incredible leader and he has a wealth of knowledge and experience having, you know, managed uh, and been a, a branch manager and been a broker. Uh, you know, he has uh, seen so many different scenarios and it's just basically, uh, you know, again, helped me out a lot with running the organization and holding the agents accountable. And, um, you know, leadership group also holds me accountable, hmm. right? I'm fully transparent with the, you know, all of our expenses, revenue, all that stuff, whatever's going on in the organization. Um, you know, it's an open book when it comes to the numbers that the organization is uh, bringing in and spending. I love that accountability goes both ways. So Rob, talk to us a little bit about um, the coach, how coaches affected you and, and how hiring a sales manager, a really good sales manager has affected the team. Um, I, I've had uh, different coaches out throughout the years and, uh, and, I, and I saw John speak at, a, at an event in New York City and um, uh, with the rate group that uh, Justin and I uh, belong to. And, uh, and I, knew, I knew Justin was being coached by him. I think this... Uh, I think it was, was it New York city a year ago? Or was it two years ago, Justin? Was it a, two years ago, two years ago. And, and I don't know, his name came up again, um, early this year. Um, and I, and I just, I don't know, actually last year I went to an event that John Cheplak went, had, and after that event, um, I, that was in, uh, Nashville, I decided to, uh, get coached by John and John's not a, a, a type of guy that, you know, gives you uh, binders and full of stuff that you don't really read. He actually is a, a, a wealth of knowledge. And uh, I, I just, John is, uh, he's actually helped our business quite a bit, especially this year. And if, and, it, and it was great to have him, especially because of COVID this year. And um, he's definitely, you know, helped us quite a bit. He's a uh, wealth of knowledge, this, uh, this person. So, I mean... Hmm. We're really appreciative to, to have him as a coach uh, for us, for our team. A special human being. Sorry? He's a special human being. Yes, he is. Great, yeah. great guy. Just, uh, um, yeah, if you met this guy, just incredible. Incredible guy. And what about your thoughts on, on a sales manager, Rob? You know what? We, uh, when we were looking for a sales manager, and, and I'll tell you, I just started with a sales manager uh, I, I, just over a year ago. And, uh, I, w I was actually looking for somebody in the corporate world, not through the, um, through, uh, real estate. Uh, cause, um, I, I felt that I wanted all the, um, you know, the experience, uh, from a corporate world. Cause I, I, if you're a sales manager, you can manage any type of sales, uh, uh, type of business. And, um, uh, so I did pick up somebody, which, uh, I think we, we felt, we feel we lucked out, um, she is always on top of the agents to make sure they're, you know, their goal setting, their follow-ups and, and discussing with them. And when I first had her start, um, um, I had her take every single one of our agents out for lunch just so they, she can get to know them. And she, and it, it was tough cause you know what, this is a new role for our business and they were, they were giving her a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, pushback. But now they, uh, they love her and uh, she's tough, but she's also, um, but they love her. Like, you know what I mean? So there's a combination of both. So she's, she's the right personality. And the company I took her from, they were really disappointed. They even, uh, they, I bumped into uh, upper management that she worked for and they said, you really lucked out with her because uh, she was, uh, she, they, they were really disappointed when, uh, when she left to, to come on board with me. But, but. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been a good role. Uh, you know, uh, it's, been, it's been good for us. Uh, we're really appreciative of having her on board with us. 
And uh, I think you mentioned if you could go back in time, you would have hired a sales manager a lot earlier. Oh, I, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a little bit delayed when it comes to uh, uh, doing, uh, getting the right people, but uh, investing, uh, investing in, in the right people in your business is, is definitely key. I understand it now more so than ever. Well, so um, with, uh, with the few minutes that we have left, there's a couple of things I wanted to, to kind of go over. One is, uh, has to do more with some nuts and bolts things. Um, and there's a lot of questions that, that have teed this topic up around marketing. I know that's a big focus um, for both of you in, in addition to the, the accountability and, and other things that you do on the team with, with culture, et cetera. Um, so I do want to touch on marketing and then I want to kind of end with some of the things that you've learned and changed um, throughout this pandemic and talk a little bit about what, what is going to continue to change for you guys in, in 2021. And to get that topic kind of kicked off here, I have one more poll for our audience. Um, so what do you plan to invest time and money into mastering in 2021? And you can check all that apply here. And I'm going to launch that poll now. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about marketing here. And um, so this is more of the nuts and bolts type stuff. Um, and I'm just going to start with some questions because there's lots of questions about marketing as well. Um, Bernie says, what's the one strongest marketing item you use to generate listing leads? And what is the strongest marketing method you use to generate buyer leads? This is for, for either of you. Um, our, a lot of our buyer, buyer leads are the online leads that uh, we get. Um, and uh, our, our listing leads are the call-ins from, from, you know, direct marketing from, you know, it could be from radio or even uh, real estate papers and uh, some direct mail uh, out there. But uh, those are our, uh, that we would get uh, as listings. Um, yeah, that, that like, but the bulk of the, the buyer leads would be the, uh, the online uh, lead generations that we get. And that's through your website, through social media, through pay-per-click uh, all, all, all of the above, all those. Yep. Absolutely. Justin. It's very similar to Rob. I mean, we have a pretty big radio presence here in Calgary. We also advertise uh, on TV. We have uh, a pretty big uh, billboard presence in and around the city and at the international airport. So that's where we generate a lot of our, uh, our seller uh, leads from, and uh, they're very, very high quality uh, listing appointments, basically. Um, some of them are just pretty much just laid down. We're just only interviewing you and the come here and list our house. So the quality of those leads are exceptionally high. We also do a lot online. Um, I operate uh, about 10 properties here in our marketplace, uh, you know, including calgary.com. And um, my primary focus on when it comes to the online stuff is search engine optimization. And I, somebody was asking what website platform I use. And then I use real estate webmasters and if you go to justinhaver.com forward slash woo, you can learn a little bit about that. And uh, I do search engine optimization, um, which is a long-term game. Uh, I've invested into this uh, since I pretty much got into the business 15 years ago, where it allows us to get a ton of organic traffic uh, on our websites. I mean, we have one website that uh, had uh, 480,000 visitors in a single month, over 4 million page views. Uh, so, you know, that generates a lot of, uh, showing requests or property inquiries. Uh, those are pretty much the primary leads that the buyer agents get. Uh, we do very little, uh, PPC, uh, or IDX registrations. Uh, those leads tend to go over to the ISA or the AI that we use. And, um, you know, once we have, uh, connected with them and we know that there's someone that's interested in buying or selling, then we will hand off those leads. Well, that's uh, pretty much what we do there with uh, leads. I mean, there's, I think we have like 16 different lead sources that uh, funnel into one CRM. And you're not, um, you're, the, most of the things that you're talking about that have helped you build momentum, both of you, are things that you had to invest in for, for years, correct? 
Correct. I mean, uh, when I first got into the business, I, I wish I would remember the name of the person that told me, but there was an agent that said, you know, always reinvest minimum 25% back into your business. And when I got into the business, I came over from uh, IT and, um, you know, I just knew that I wanted to invest into websites. And I knew that, you know, in order to su survive in this business, you needed leads. Uh, so I started uh, investing into website platforms very early on, probably turned into a little bit of an addiction, I would say, uh, you know, with acquiring domain names and building out these uh, websites. But I look at, you know, what I have here today for our organization with, you know, all these uh, domain names and even acquiring Calgary.com for, you know, our, our team, uh, it, they become digital assets for our organization. And um, I know that, you know, for somebody to have a replicate the kind of traffic that we generate on our uh, website, someone would have to spend in the neighborhood of seven to eight hundred thousand dollars a month on Google AdWords, Canadian dollars, by the way, um, not US. But so the traffic that we get is enormous from having made these investments, uh, you know, over now almost 15 years. Hmm. Rob? Yeah, we, we uh, reinvest every year ourselves. Uh, uh, we've probably uh, reinvested this year, probably more so uh, than ever uh, in all of the years, especially coming into 2021. Um, and I think, I think you have to. Uh, if you're not reinvesting into your business, um, you're going to fall by the wayside. And large, large teams are just going to swallow up all the businesses in, in your markets. So... Um, in, in order to grow, you have to reinvest uh, to, to, to maintain the same level or even grow in your business. Mm -hmm. And, and so, oh, go ahead, Justin, sorry. Yeah, you know what, that's typically very scary too, right? To reinvest money into something that you may know that you're not gonna get your return on right away, especially when it comes to like search engine optimization, that's more of a long-term game. And if you have the wrong partner doing your search engine optimization, I mean, it's like driving down the freeway, throwing cash out the window. But, you know, it's also something that, uh, you know, when the market retracts and, and when we had, you know, COVID hit, uh, you know, we had to make some pretty uh, quick decisions on, you know, cutting some advertising or pausing some advertising and uh, really just kind of uh, analyze the landscape that we're heading into. And where do you see the best return on investment? Um, for somebody that's getting started, what would you recommend for a, a good ROI? Um, because obviously the, the, the advertising on the radio and other things like that in the market, um, that's branding that takes a little while to build up momentum for you. The SEO takes a little bit of time to build up momentum. What would you say is, is kind of a, a good place to start for ROI and how would you recommend that people approach that? Uh, I, I would say um, it, you got to start uh, doing something on Facebook and uh, Instagram videos. Just that's the only way it, it, the least expensive way to get started and build, build from there. Um, uh, and then you start building your brand and, um, and then, and then just grow from there, just add on, add on, add on. And then you get to a point where you're, your uh, brand becomes uh, strong, and uh, and once once you've achieved a level where you know that you're one of the top five or ten agents in your market that people know about, now you just got to grow from there. But hmm. I think it, it, it is tough. It is tough, but you just you're going to have to do a lot of digital marketing uh, if you want to do it uh, cheaply to get started and just grow from there. And, and safe to say, you'd recommend if, if somebody's a really small team or, or they're a solo agent, they should expect to call each one of those leads eight to 10 times. Absolutely. More. It's like Justin said, 20 times. Right. Yeah. So, so what, I would, what I would say, I mean, if you're a new agent looking to get into the business or you've just gotten into the business, I think the safest thing to do would be to perhaps join a team you know, get the proper coaching or training and develop your skills. Um, and then you may want to branch out on your own after a few years, or maybe you just look at this as that as a great opportunity because you don't have to take those marketing uh, risks and spend uh, thousands of dollars. But if you do want to spend some money, um, I would recommend getting a website and then having a, you know, 
fairly small budget for pay-per-click or Google AdWords so you can generate some opportunities and then just learn how to convert those leads into appointments and get some sales and then continue to reinvest a portion of your commissions back into the business. Um, you know, that's one way you can do it. Uh, you know, if you want to do it for free, utilize social media. It's all about consistency uh, in uh, getting the right messaging to the market. If you can consistently do video every day on the social media platforms, after six months, I'm sure that you would uh, get some business out of that and it wouldn't cost you anything but time. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen agents um, involved in some social media groups and some coaching organizations that focus on that. And it's pretty incredible how much of a return you can get um, from, from a very small budget on social media if you're willing to put in that kind of daily, weekly videos um, like you're talking about there, Justin. But yeah. it has to be consistent. It has to be consistent. And we, we have found that from our experience running, you know, uh, retargeting or Facebook ads, dynamic Facebook ads and all that kind of stuff. Um, we find that they're half as effective as, uh, you know, Google ad mm. or good leads that come from Google, uh, whether it's registration leads and that kind of stuff. So, um, because I mean, a lot of the leads that are generated on social media, people accidentally just click on it just to look at pictures. But if they're, you know, doing a search in Google and landing on your Google uh, AdWord or your website organically, they have intent to purchase real estate. Whereas, uh, you know, social media, a lot of us tend to spend a little bit of time just uh, daydreaming and whoops, clicked on that, didn't mean to do that, right? So those are a lot harder to convert. But at the same time, you're building a database. So maybe two, three, four years down the road, they may transact. With you. Right. So that we, which is another key point of, of, of the advertising game is to make sure that you have um, a good a good place to put all your leads. You can nurture them over a long period of time because not everybody that you collect is is looking to buy today. Yeah, what do they say? Data is the new oil. Data is the new oil. So um, we're almost out of time here, and I have a ton of questions that we just didn't get to. Lots of chats that we just didn't get to, and I do want to make sure we have um, some time to to talk a little bit about COVID and the pandemic. I know. Um, Maybe some people are just sick and tired of, of hearing about it and thinking about it, but it is our, our current reality still. Um, there's been some positive news that, uh, that we've all heard on that front, but um, why don't you, um, Rob, can you share with us, what's your team's approach going to be going into um, 2021 as it relates to the pandemic? What are you guys doing differently um, because of the pandemic and maybe just what are you going to do differently based on just lessons that you've learned? Um, we're probably, you know, uh, just, uh, uh, we, we did a lot of changes through the, um, through the, uh, pandemic. We, 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 we opened up our podcast booth, uh, that we do. Um, it's, it's hard to tell. It just, uh, uh, there's a lot of different things that like a lot of, mechanical that supports each other but just you know we're, we're going to be probably recruiting more agents um we're uh, testing out uh some different platforms of marketing um and i did that uh in the last four or five months and i tried it a couple of times and took it away and, and see if see what the response was and we found that um when i took it away I regret doing it because it did work well. So, so we'll be adding that platform to uh, the 2021 year. Um, th 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 there's just so many components. Uh, we're investing more money. So we're hoping that uh, that'll generate uh, more sales uh, for us in, uh, in 2021. Uh, you know, we'll find out what, uh, if that's going to work out for us or not hiring more agents and, and, and adding more to the marketing and uh, is going to be the key factors uh, to, to growing in 2021. So Justin, same question for you, COVID pandemic 2021. Um, where are you going to be investing time and doing things differently? You know, one of the things that we have learned from the pandemic is that uh, it's all about the people. Uh, it's uh, about your staff, it's about your agent, and it's about the consumer. It's about, uh, you know, ensuring that people feel safe and that they're comfortable. 
so, you know, we um, focused a lot on just reaching out to people in our database uh, when we had the first uh, initial shutdown here in March, uh, just to connect with them on a human level, uh, not trying to sell them anything. And, uh, you know, within our organization, we also started to have some, you know, daily huddles just to have some sort of regular routine for the agents and staff that wanted to participate in it. Uh, where we basically declare one thing that we're grateful for, one personal commitment, and one professional commitment each day. And, uh, you know, we're still running that account that uh, it's kind of like a mini accountability group, actually. Um, but we call it the morning huddle. And uh, it has actually grown into something of its own. So we're going to continue to do that, continue to uh, ensure um, that everyone on the team, staff and agents are safe. Like right now, all of our staff are working from home and uh, at the same time, uh, let the consumers know that we have the ability to help people move in a safe manner. And, uh, you know, we, um, we were running Matterport uh, cameras prior to the pandemic, but uh, when the pandemic hit, we doubled down on it, picked up a few more cameras and we were basically applying that with every single listing that we uh, put on the market, which, you know, tells the sellers that, uh, you know, we want to ensure that you're safe and that, uh, you know, perhaps we have less showings, but are more serious buyers because the buyers have the ability to obviously view the properties from the comfort and safety of their home, less disruption for the sellers, keeping everyone uh, probably a little less exposed. But, uh, you know, we just got to continue on to just build on relationships and uh, focus on, on the human aspect of it. And uh, going into 2021, I mean, here in Alberta, I mean, cases are spiking and, uh, you know, it's going to be a, an interesting winter for us. And, uh, you know, we will just have to kind of uh, keep doing what we have been doing all year, uh, being nice and kind to one another and support each other and, uh, you know, make sure that we continue to reach out, um, you know, to our clients and, uh, you know, still operate the business at a high level, continue to reinvest, continue to grow, um, growing with the right agents that we'll bring on or the right staff and, uh, you know, just uh, have a lot of fun, but at the same time, um, you know, focus on the human aspect of it. I love that. So um, I just want to briefly thank you both. I have one more question for you um, each in, in just a minute here, but I do want to thank you both for, for coming on and being so willing to share um, information with, with our audience here today. Um, Remax agents from around North America that uh, have been hanging on your every word, I'm sure. So you have such a wealth of information and experience to share with us, and we really appreciate you guys. Um, and I do want to just quickly mention, um, you know, I'm, I'm with Realvolve and FirePoint and Realvolve Workflows, Realvolve CRM, the FirePoint um, platform with our websites uh, and CRM. Um, we're, we're here to help. And so we do want to talk to you guys um, everybody that joined us today, we would love to talk with you about what you're doing. And if we're not the right fit for you, that's a perfectly acceptable answer. Um, but for those that do join us for um, a quick demo, um, sometime in December, you're going to get a free 60 page blueprint. Uh, it's a business planner and a guided video course that uh, our very own Valerie Garcia um, has put together. And this is a training course that um, she typically sells for, for $100. And she's agreed to give it away to everybody that joins us for uh, a quick demo of FirePoint or Realvolve in December. So you can go to realvolve.com forward slash demo um, or firepoint.net forward slash demo. Um, and we specialize on the Realvolve side um, in workflows and in um, lead nurture. There's limitless automation. We have a very robust automation platform called the workflow platform. Um, we can synchronize with a lot of the Google apps. Uh, we do document storage. There's listing management, property management, um, uh, transaction management, as well as some campaigns and other things to help you nurture your leads and stay in touch with your past clients. So uh, check that out if you're looking to invest any time in your, in your CRM this year. Um, join us for a quick demo. And again, no is a perfectly acceptable answer, but we would love to show you what we've got and figure out if it's going to be a good fit for you. Um, so again, um, thanks gentlemen for joining us. And I have one, my one final question for you. 
Um, what's the best hockey team in the NHL? Not Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> or Edmonton. Or Calgary. No. <laughs> well, the best guys, team is the team that won the yeah. cup, right? Yeah. Well, are you, are you guys hockey fans? I, I have people Justin asking. Is- just as a big hockey fan, I'm not as much. My, uh, I, I grew up with a lot of sisters, so there wasn't much hockey uh, on my TV growing up. But uh, my kids were big hockey fans, and uh, but uh, I know Justin is because he goes to uh, if he if he's in any city around the, uh, Canada and the United States, he'll go to a hockey game. Uh, from my understanding, but uh, yeah, I, would yeah. assume, I would assume Calgary's your favorite team, Justin. <sighs> Well, I mean, I got to cheer for the local team, but uh, if any of you guys ever go to Vegas and have the opportunity to take in a Vegas Golden Knights game, uh, that is a pretty awesome experience from an NHL standpoint, uh, just the atmosphere in the building. So uh, any ha- hockey fans on here, uh, if you ever go to Vegas, make sure you do that. Well, thank you very much um, again, both of you. And thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we're gonna be sending out the recording. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them in. If you have questions for uh, Justin and Rob um, that we didn't get to, shoot me an email, dale at realvolve.com and uh, I'll forward it on to them. And if they have some time and would be generous, um, they'll share those answers. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. We'll see you next time. Take care guys. Take care. Thank you.